and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at linode.com slash podcast.init and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your next app or experimenting with something you hear about on the show. You can visit the site at www.podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. And to help other people find the show, you can leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music, tell your friends and coworkers, and share it on social media. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Dave Vandenbout about Skittle, a library for designing and validating circuit layouts. So Dave, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, Tobias. Uh, I work for and run a small company, XS Corporation, that makes uh, field programmable gate array circuit boards. And as part of that work, I use a open source schematic and PCB layout program called KiCad. And part of my uh, uh, effort in, in using that was to develop this Skittle uh, language that is an add-on for Python. And is Skittle an anagram for something, or is it just a sort of whimsical name for it, or...? I'm just really bad at coming up with names, so uh, it stands for Schematic KiCad Design Language. Yeah, well, uh, naming is one of the hard problems in computer science, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. nobody will fault you for that. Exactly. So how did you first get introduced to the Python programming language? Um, back in 2011, I had a friend who was trying to build some boards with a little camera, a little camera chip from a cell phone, and it wasn't documented at all. And he said, maybe you can figure out how to talk to this chip and what the registers mean. So uh, I got one of the uh, little camera modules and, and hooked it up to an FPGA. And then I talked to that FPGA through some C++ uh, library that I had, but I wanted to put a GUI on the front of it. And I said, now, you know, maybe I'll learn how to use Python to do that. So I learned how to use Python to build the GUI, and then I interfaced to the C++ programs through, through C types, which is about the worst way possible to introduce yourself to Python, but uh, that's where I kind of got started with it. <laughs> yeah, you got to start somewhere, and if the first experience is painful, then it just means that all your yeah. subsequent experience where you're not doing C types just feels like the best thing ever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's just, and I've converted a lot of programs that I had done in C++ over to Python now, and, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, much easier to port it to other systems now than it, than it was before. Right. When I first started school for computer engineering, the first language they started us off with was C++, which was a little painful and a bit of a steep learning curve. And then uh, after that, it was Java, which after C++, Java felt terse and uh, eloquent. So right. by the time I found Python, I was like, whoa, this is amazing. I started off with C++ back in uh, like the 1990, and uh, it was understandable then, but I've gone back and I've looked at some C++ modern C++ now, and I, and I look at it, and I, I, I cannot understand it. It looks like, it's kind of like uh, when liberal arts went through that deconstructive phase where the, where they took all the old classics and reinterpreted them based upon modern ideas, and nobody could understand what they meant anymore. Yeah. And uh, the, I looked at the C++, and I said, you know, I, I just can't figure out what you're trying to say with this anymore. So I was glad to get involved with Python. I, like you said, it's a, it's a lot clearer and, and a lot more expressive, at least in my view, than C++. You need C++ for embedded systems and things like that, but uh, but if, if I'm not in an embedded world, then I'm going to try to use Python. Yeah, and even these days, things like Rust and uh, even other programming languages like Nim or Crystal mm -hmm. are starting to edge into that space right. as well. Right. Or even depending on the how restrictive of an embedded system you're running, you can still even use Python if you're using something like uh, MicroPython. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I've been interested in that MicroPython running on the ESP8266 boards. Get yourself an embedded Python system for a buck and a half. Yeah. Um, so you touched briefly on what Skittle is. So I'm wondering if you can dig a bit deeper into that and share the problem that you're trying to solve when you first started working on it. Okay, so uh, when you're building an electronic system, you typically have four phases in it, and it's kind of like writing a program. And the first phase is always planning. Define the goal, what functions you're going to need, what the architecture is going to look like for the electronic system. The next phase is after you've done that is uh, designing a schematic. In that phase, you select the circuit components and you create interconnections that carry signals from one pin on one component to the pins of other components. The output from this phase is what they call a net list. And that is just a list of each wire, or as they call them, uh, they call them nets. Hence the name netlist. And each net is just a list of pins on each component that is attached to that net. So it's, it says this wire goes between 
these pins and those are the pins it connects to. And you can think of it as kind of like uh, an intermediate code uh, like you might get out of the front end of a compiler. It, it describes the logic but it doesn't really describe all the details of it. And this is a portion where Skittle comes into play. The next phase is called layout and that's where you take the netlist and translate it into the physical pattern of wire traces between the chip packages on a circuit board. And a lot of factors come into play here. This is where you're moving the, the chip packages around and you're trying to reduce the length of the physical wires that go between the chips because you want them as short as possible so that they, they don't slow down. And uh, you want the chips packed as closely together as possible because you want to use a small board because it's cheaper. Uh, this is kind of similar to the phase in, in where you're generating machine code from the intermediate code and where you're concerned with things like reducing the code size and eliminating the asset access to off-chip memory, things like that. So those two phases between hardware design and, and code and uh, comp compilation are kind of similar. And once you've done the layout, then you've got a description of uh, where the chips are going to go on the board and how they're connected and where the wiring traces should be physically on that board. So you send that information off usually in the form of what they call a GER files and you send it off to a board fabrication house and a couple of weeks later uh, or you know a couple of days if you're willing to pay a couple of thousand dollars they will send you back a nice circuit board and you can mount components on the board and and then you can start to exercise it with various electrical inputs and look at what the outputs are doing and things like that and at this point it's similar to to testing a compiled program and in fact most of the curse words you hear are the same between both domains uh, <laughs> and followed by that you uh the last phase which is probably the, the most important phase is when things don't work then you get into the assignment of blame and the persecution of the innocent and so on and so forth but, <laughs> but that's basically the circuit design set of phases you go through and the schematics when i started off which was back in the the late 70s we used to draw those on drafting tables and and then we'd extract the netlist from that from those drawings manually and then we translate that into PCBs using Ruby list uh, sheets that we cut with exacto knives or we'd use this black tape and decal stuff that we put down on mylar on mylar sheets and then we photograph it and expose boards and and do all these nasty things that, that meant that once you put once you design a circuit you really did not want to change it all these methods have been supplanted by electronic design automation software and if I say EDA, that's what I mean, electronic design automation, uh, and that's all really took hold in the in the late in the late seventies and has replaced all the manual stuff that we used to do. And both schematic and layout software tools largely try to replicate those processes, those manual processes from earlier in the seventies. You know, the the layout of this of the schematic on the on the drawing board is now replicated on the computer screen, and the cutting of the uh, of the mylar uh, of the ruby list traces and things like that is is done graphically on the computer screen by just laying out the traces so both types of tools both schematic uh the schematic entry tool and the pcb layout tool are graphical in nature or, or at least they have been the problem is that the graphical metaphor for the schematic parts doesn't really work anymore and it probably hasn't worked since the 90s back in the old days circuits used to be made from really simple components like resistors capacitors transistors small scale integration logic all of these had easily recognized symbols you know it's symbol for an AND gate the symbol for a transistor and they all had just a couple of pins on them and each one had a, a very well defined function and signal flow you knew current went in one end of a resistor and it came out the other end there were two terminals you know that a transistor had a base with, with a little current went in there and if you tickled it with a little current that transistor would act like a switch and it would close so you understood what was going on and when you put all those components as the other end schematic you could look at the sch schematic and you could understand it by looking at the, the overall signal flow and it usually went from right to left across the page and the simple functions got applied to the voltages and currents along the way and you, you could figure it out by look just by looking at it and to prove that to prove the value of that schematic in terms of understanding if you take a schematic from that era and interpret it uh, uh, in the normal way it's easy 
But then if you take it and flip it 180 degrees so the top goes to bottom and left goes to right, and then look at the schematic and try to explain it, then you're in your mind, you're trying to figure out where the signal is going, what's happening with it, because you've lost all of that pattern recognition about what's going on with the normal format for how it's normally laid out. So it takes about 10 times as long. So there's a lot of value in that schematic with those simple components back in the 70s. And, you know, the, it's kind of like when you flip the schematic over, it's kind of like trying to take a, you take a program and remove all your syntax coloring in your white space and then try to interpret that program. It just gets a whole lot more difficult. And that's what schematics used to give you. But we don't make the circuits from those simple components anymore, at least you know, they're still there, but uh, now we've got much bigger chips. We've got modern processors, and we got ASICs, and we got FPJs, and these can have over a thousand pins. In fact, some of the FPGAs go up to 2,000 pins. And signals are going all over the place. They're going into pins, they're coming out of pins. Sometimes the signals are analog, sometimes they're digital, and they can actually switch from analog to digital while the circuit is operating uh, with, with some of these with some of these chips, at least that's possible. Although mainly they stick as being either analog or digital. And there's a lot of programming in the chips. Your microcontrollers have programs, the FPGAs have programs. So there's a lot of hidden internals in the chips now. So most of the components now, when you draw a schematic, they're rectangular blobs with pins on them. They're just big bags of pins. And there's no general signal flow for a chip. You can't just look at one of these microcontrollers and say, oh yeah, the signals go in on the left and they're going to come out on the right. It all depends upon how it's programmed and whether those pins are going to be inputs or outputs or how they're going to be shifted around. So if you take a modern schematic with all these blobs with pins on them and you look at it and then you flip it over 180 80 degrees. It makes as much sense that way as it made the first way. In other words, it makes no sense. But people still try to use graphical schematic editors to design those circuits with these big chips. And when you have a thousand pin chip, you're typically using a multi-sheet hierarchical schematic. And if you've ever done that, you, you're endlessly fiddling with moving these chips around on the sheet trying to get one close to the other, draw the wires in between them, adjust the wires so that they, they make sense and that they run from one to the other. You're trying to put meaning into the schematic that probably isn't really there. You're trying to drag it out and it's, it's going to resist you to do that. Then you combine that with the fact that the EDA software usually has the worst GUI ever created because it was built by engineers that were trying to design circuit boards, not by software programmers that knew how GUIs are supposed to be put together. So you get all these these arcane operations. You don't have cut and paste like you do in a word processor. It's, it's always something a little bit strange and skewed that looks kind of like cut and paste but doesn't act the same way. So you get all these errors just caused by the tool itself and by the way you're trying to interact with it. So it's possible that maybe schematics just don't work for us anymore. And I'm on a uh, I'm on a news group or a, a, an information board for for KiCad, and people write in with their problems, and other people you know try to try to solve it. And people are always on there asking about schematics. How do I do a hierarchical schematic? How do I do a global signal? And how do I keep it from interfering with a local signal? And how do I cut and paste blocks between the different sheets of the schematics? You know, it's all always uh, the nitty-gritty details of how to draw the schematic is it's always open to question and one day somebody came on and said you know i don't want to do schematics anymore i just want to write the net list directly i just want to say this pin goes he you know starts here goes over here that's a lot like writing machine code directly which is possible but you know not recommended and uh but i thought that's a good idea may not be a good way to do it but that's a good idea so that you can manage the details a lot more easily without always having to fit with the details about where the wires are going to and trying to make everything look nice. So I figured somebody already had done something like this because it seemed like an obvious good idea. So I went looking around and I found a program already that was called PHDL that was invented out at uh, Brigham Young University back in 2011 or so. And it's written in Java and it has all these features for just wiring together chips using, using a uh, text language that they invented. It's also a little bit restricted to that particular problem domain. 
and it has a special syntax. So in that aspect, it's kind of like uh, so many EDA tools. It's, it's always going to be a little bit quirky, but it never really seemed to catch on that well. It's been pretty quiet, the news groups on that, since 2012. I think the, the main developers at the university went on and went to industry. I think they graduated, and the, the language is still there. You can still download it. You can still use it, but the news groups are really pretty pretty much like ghost towns so i like but i liked it i like phdl not its syntax or the java implementation but i liked the overall gestalt of it so uh i also had some experience in another program called my hdl which is a digital hardware description language that's built on top of python and it's just a package you can download and it hijacks all the python machinery so you can describe and simulate digital hardware and then output either vhdl or var log code that can be compiled right into an FPGA. So, you know, you can stay strictly in Python and get all of your simulations worked out, get all your architecture details worked out. And only then do you have to generate some Verilog or VHDL and, and do the detailed programming into the FPGA. And that brings all the Python libraries into play that you can use during your simulations to, to do things like uh, get more visualization and visualization into the, into the process and things like that. And that's something that wasn't in PHDL. It, like I said, it was kind of restricted just to describing schematics and it didn't have anything else, any other general purpose language functions in there. So anyway, I took the good ideas from PHDL, which were, you know, how to hook circuits together in a re iterative, repetitive way uh, with, with a very uh, concise kind of a kind of a textual um, um, format, and I re-implemented those as a Python package like my, like my HDL, and that's what Skittle turned out to be. And uh, it looks, you know, it looks out for the circuitry details while letting you express the design using all the good features of Python. And uh, the good thing I like about it is that, that it hijacks Python, so it kind of rides along on the back of Python, and then as Python gets better and better, Skittle gets better and better at the same, at the same time. Uh, and that means that you don't have to spend as much effort uh, improving Skittle. There's a lot of people out there working on Python that are going to be doing it for you. So uh, that's pretty much where it came from and, and how it got started. And uh, so we can go from there. That was uh, definitely very informative. I've had a bit of experience working with things like VHDL, which it sounds like having my HDL probably would have made my life a bit easier <laughs> when I was working on that. And I can definitely sympathize with the lack of, I guess, accuracy in dealing with some of the visual layout tools for mm -hmm. building circuits, because my experience with that was generally kind of frustrating of trying to figure out how to actually get the traces to you know, properly connect between ports. And also, as you said, a lot of the chips that we're working with these days, they really aren't amenable to being able to visually decipher what it is that's actually happening on the board, which right. again is not even necessarily laid out ahead of time at the time when the circuits are even being defined. There right. are any number of different possible approaches to it, especially with the uh, inclusion of things like GPIO or I2C ports where there's not even any telling what's going to be placed on the other end of it in right. terms of the voltage requirements or the you know input output signals and which pins those are going to be fired from. You know, as, as I said, most of my experience of working with these circuits is been done using a graphical tool, but I can also see where being able to actually visualize the circuit as you're working on it could be valuable as well, because while it isn't as informative as it used to be, being able to understand a, a different representation of it rather than just the abstract code that's being used mm -hmm. might be useful. So I'm wondering if there is any sort of method for which you can actually run your Skittle code to generate graphical output of the circuit diagram, whether it's by importing the netlist into something like KiCad or any other mechanism that you've got built into it. Right now, there's not. I suspect that maybe you could use some of the existing tools for generating graphical depictions of a program. Maybe some of those could come into play with Skittle. Or you might be able to have Skittle, since it's just generalized Python, you know, as it's as it's generating uh, its netlists, it could also be outputting something into like a graph viz program, and then then graph viz could be used to kind of straighten it out and, and give you a, a, a signal flow. But you mentioned VHDL. Um, I've worked with VHDL and had to look at the gate level realizations of what the VHDL code does, uh, which is something that you never want to have to do. But when things go wrong, you have to sometimes. And what you get is a big old glop of of gates with this maze of wires running in between them. And they try to do a good job of, 
of moving the signals from left to right across the page and, and and so it's not like the signals are feeding back into the beginning of the circuitry and things like that but even as good as they do that it's still not a representation that's going to be easy to understand for a large circuit because it's still going to be a large circuit. It's still going to have hierarchy in it. You're still going to be ha- have to be diving in between pages, going from one page to another, unless you just blow the whole thing out so it's flat onto a single screen and try to try to move around, pan your way through that. But uh, even that, once you've flattened it out like that, you've lost all of your structure. Uh, every, uh, all the hierarchy, in a way, tries to tries to tell you what the circuit is doing. It tries to put some structure on it, so it's easy to understand. So if you take all the hierarchy out, then you've got a flat circuit, and that's also difficult to understand. But if you leave the hierarchy in, then you got to go diving around between the pages and tracing the signals from one to the other. It all is going to be difficult to understand, no matter how you do it. I guess the question is: is what kind of information you're looking for in that schematic and how can you get the equivalent out of something like Skittle? I guess that I'm throwing the question back to you is when you get that s- schematic and you look at it, what do you want to see? What do you want to try to figure out from that? Right. Yeah, and I think that's also probably largely dependent on the level of experience of the person who's working on the schematic of, mm-hmm. you know, are they somebody who's just starting out and they need that visual representation mm-hmm. to be able to conceptualize what's actually happening? Right. Or is it getting to the point where having that visual representation is so inherently meaningless because of the level of complexity that's involved that mm-hmm. they would be better suited just learning and training themselves to be able to understand how the overall process is working just through the representation and the code. Right. Well, here's the good thing about it is you don't have to choose. <laughs> you get the, you can have the best of both worlds if you want. When you're starting out, there's no reason why you can't start out with a schematic editor. If you're doing small circuits, schematic editor is just fine for doing that. It's only when you get up to the, the bigger circuits that you really need to think about maybe using something like Skittle. Now, if you and if you want to get experience with using Skittle and trying to you know, form in your head a mental model of, of what Skittle does. You know how the schematics work. You can actually take a schematic, at least in KiCad, you can generate a net list from it. And then you can pass that net list through another little program that I've got in addition to Skittle. It's called um, Net List to Skittle. And it'll take that net list from whatever schematic you've created and it will generate a Skittle program from that. So then you, so you can, you know, do your circuitry in the schematic editor, pass the net list through that program netlist to skittle and you can look at the equivalent skittle code for that and you can say oh i see this resistor here is over here in the code here's how it's connected to these pins here are where the nets are this is how those are connected together so you can do a one-to-one comparison and, and get some experience going from a, a a format that you know over into a format that you don't know and then you can translate that knowledge about how to do skittle for a small circuit into doing skittle for a much larger circuit It also seems like that would be a useful way of building up a library of modules where you're visually designing a small component piece of the overall circuit, generating the netlist, and then translating that to the Skittle code, which you can then turn into a function and then just compose all the various components together with the Skittle code to build the overall circuit. Right. That's that's also a a good way to to do that. I mean, that, that can also bring in a lot of existing modules that are already out there that are implemented embedded as schematics all you got to do is pass them through the skittle converter and all of a sudden you, you know you've got the modules in a as, as a python module that you can use uh it, i mean if you've ever tried to take a schematic from somebody else and use it in your own schematic it's always a question about how to get that thing merged in there at least in KiCad it is but uh we already know how to do all that merging of of modules with you know subroutines and things in python and almost every other language so it makes it a lot easier to use modules modules from to take modules from one person to another and uh, as you mentioned one of the more difficult pieces of the hardware integration phase is the actual testing process so i'm wondering what kinds of facilities and processes are in place for skittle programs to actually try and preempt some of that uh, by using unit testing or also just uh, i know that it has some built-in validation for Mm -hmm. making sure that you don't have open loops or invalid circuits in the program right yeah the uh if you look at schematic editors you don't have any of those things 
I mean, you more or less you do your you do your circuit, you know, you do your schematic, and then you visually check it to make sure that it corresponds to what you think it is. You can try to run it through a spice simulator, but you know, there are, if you've got a microcontroller in your schematic, then that's not going to be simulated in spice. So you you know, it's it's not an analog simulation anymore. And so when you do a schematic the way that we've done them for years now, then in a lot of cases you're just eyeballing it and trying to figure out, you know, you're trying to figure out if it works or not. And then you're going ahead and having it manufactured. And then you, then when you get it back, you test it in hardware and, and you throw all the jumper wires onto it, you know, trying to, and cutting traces and trying to make it work that way. With Skittle, you've got the ability, the, the same ability that you have with schematic uh, editors, which is it, it does simple checks for you. It can check to make sure that you don't have an unconnected pin on on a device it can check to make sure that you don't have two drivers on the same net that are driving against each other which can cause you know d- damage to one or both devices it can check that you don't have like a one pin net where you've connected a net from one pin on a device but you haven't made a connection to anything else so it's just kind of hanging out there flopping around so it does all those simple checks but you can also this is a feature i haven't put out publicly yet but can also attach attach little routines to your to certain nets that check those that do specialized checks on those nets so that uh, if you need to have a certain fan out or if you can't have a, a certain fan out on a net it will check that and you can set the fan out level to make sure that it doesn't connect to too many other pins and slow the circuitry down so by having those little specialized subroutines that you can hang on to nets you can do some more detailed checking but overall in, in terms of testing if you've got programmable types of devices out there that that have substantial internal uh, operations going on. Those are just really hard to test unless you've hooked them up to some kind of an external simulator that can hook up to the uh, hook up to your other circuit simulator, and they kind of pass information back and forth. But you don't really see as much of that. You, in fact, you you never really see that in hobbyist level circuitry. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask about the possibility of having circuit emulators for things like microcontrollers mm-hmm. or ARM chips or something like that to be mm-hmm. able to drive some of the inputs and then, you know, determine the outputs for various pins depending on what the inputs are from the circuit. But that seems like the kind of thing that you could probably get rigged up by the fact that, you know, that Skittle is Python based. It seems like something you might be able to get rigged up uh, if you had some experience at, at working with those other simulation programs. I don't think you'd have much much luck doing that with a with a standard schematic editor program though so wondering what the internal architecture or the uh, design approach that you took for building skittle looks like and also some of the biggest challenges that you faced while working on it well skittle is really pretty simple internally there are probably let's see you got a you've got a class for libraries and those libraries just hold on to the to the list of parts so what skittle does is it goes uh, it works in concert with the kiked library system and it goes through and reads all the libraries and, and forms an internal library from all those external libraries it just has all these part objects in it each part you know object is a is a in the part class and basically they're just big bags of pins there are these pin objects the pin class and those just implement the pins that go onto the device and pins can be assigned to another class called the net class which stores pins between various devices and makes sure that if you're on a net you can query the net and say all right what pin objects do you have hold of and you can get a list of those and then you can ask those pin objects okay what part are you a member of and then it can tell you well i'm pin number one and i belong to the microcontroller controller part that's over here and then the other guy can say oh i'm pin number pin number two and i belong to the resistor that attaches over there to the vcc supply so i'm a pull-up pin i mean i'm a pull-up device that kind of thing and then you have the you have a, a bus object which is really just a collection of net objects bundled together so you can have these multi-bit buses which are obviously useful for microcontroller and and uh, FPGA data paths. And then you have, at the very top level, you have what's called a, a, a sub-circuit or a circuit class that holds on to the entire, the entire net list and uh, is responsible for dumping it out at the very end and uh, doing the, uh, the um, engineering rules check on it to make sure that the nets aren't 
floating or that they don't have too many drivers on and things like that. So those are basically the four or five classes that are involved there. And if you look at the code, and again, I'm an engineer, I'm not a trained computer scientist. So the criticism I lay against the schematic editor tools as being written by engineers, same criticism can be applied to Skittle. Uh, I, did, <laughs> I did the best that I could, but it's all pretty simple code. The uh, The hardest problem I had in there was, was the nets and keeping everything tied together because when you tie you know you have to be able to tie one pin to another pin and form a net dynamically or you have to be able to tie a pin to a net or you have to be able to tie a net to a pin and all these different combinations for a while there i was having trouble with the nets would drop pins that they would disassociate from one net and they'd get lost and i had to figure out you know because objects were being copied around and all of a sudden the, the, the object copies weren't being linked to this to the pins that they were supposed to so they were getting dropped out so i had to go through a lot of rigmarole trying to trying to figure that out but i finally got the net class once i got the net class working correctly then it made everything pretty simple uh from a syntactic point uh, it, it made the way that the python syntax was for connecting the uh nets and the pins together became much simpler once I got the net class straightened out in my head as to how it should work. But that's really, you know, you know, those are the kinds of kinds of challenges. I, I think though that when I got done with it, it's it's like a you know, it's like three thousand lines of, of code and it probably half of that is comments. But I stop and I look at it and I say, you know, somebody that really knew what they were doing has probably got a uh, probably got a way to take a, an existing Python module and, and write maybe 300 lines of code to go around that and they could probably do the whole thing yeah well uh if anybody out there is interested in uh refactoring it or trying to see if they can uh, improve the overall code efficiency of it then uh i'm I'm assuming that you would welcome any contributions on that front yeah i mean it's uh it's out there it's on github and uh it's uh anybody that wants to go take a look at it uh, be my guest Usually the largest barrier to anything like this is just getting it started and getting it out there. And mm-hmm. then right. the uh, subsequent optimizations, it makes it a lot more likely that somebody else will come along and improve on something versus actually going and starting it on their own because you know the, the act of creation is usually the hardest act. The act of modification is a uh, much smaller step to take. Yeah, I was reading uh, reading some article a couple of weeks ago. It says, you know, there really are two classes of, of programmers and they're not they're not really they, they don't really overlap that much but there's the guys that want to go out there and, and get something work and they want to create something and and that's their their whole impetus and then there's the other guys that are the optimizers and they like to take something that's already existing and they like to they like to cut all the fat out of it and make it work really smooth and make it work really well and uh, I probably need <laughs> probably need one of those guys to go through the code and and, uh, and, and fix it up. Well, uh, thank goodness that we have both of those kinds of programmers yeah, around. Exactly. Otherwise, I'm sure that uh, a lot of the software that we are running and relying on would be even scarier than it already is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a, yeah, a lot of it is really scary. I was looking through some some code for another project the other night and uh and uh it was also written by an engineer and, and <laughs> even i even i was gassed at it <laughs> <laughs> so uh you touched on this briefly but uh, a lot of times when you're building the actual schematic and the pcb layout from the net list one of the things that you want to try to optimize for is shortening the traces mm-hmm. and optimizing for space layout in terms of voltage efficiency but also thermal dissipation and things like that so i'm wondering if there's any facility built into skittle for being able to uh, optimize some of the overall layout for that there isn't anything built in for that and i i'm not really sure that um you can handle that at the schematic level that's those issues are typically handled when you get over into the pcb layout software that that's where you you start to uh move the the chips around on screen and he's saying well I, I can see all these nets that are going in between these particular pins so i'm going to try to get this chip over close to that chip and you know because uh, the wires will be shorter and but then you know oh my god when i move that chip then there's another chip over here or another connector over here and now i've got all these long wires going over here so i gotta make a trade-off and then you say well I'm, now i've got too many uh, too many chips together in this area and it's going to get hot here so do I have to spread them out a little bit do I have room for uh, for a, for a heat sink to put on top of these chips or are they going to interfere with each other is the, you know is the case going to get in the way of this you know so on and so forth it, te- it typically tends to be uh, part of the of the physical trade-offs you made you make it in the in the PCB layout program and you know that's the place where the graphical nature of the PCB layout program makes a lot of sense because uh, 
you get to tap into that that human intuition about how to spatially arrange things. There are some places that Skittle could be improved to help that out a little bit. Um, one of the things is if you're doing a hierarchical design where you've got, say you've got a module that is a crystal oscillator and crystal oscillators typically have a couple of little capacitors attached to them. So you want to enclose that inside of a, inside of a module that whenever you want a crystal oscillator in your design, you just call that module and it drops down the crystal and a couple of capacitors for you. Well, it would be nice if when you did that, if when you generated a net list, you also generated something like a, like a position coordinate file that said okay this this crystal and these two little capacitors they're kind of related to each other so they should go close to each other in the circuit board so that when you get your initial net list imported into the pcb layout editor these three components get initially placed close to each other so that you can see yeah they're all kind of related to one another and that would probably help a lot in terms of laying out your board because if you design it in skittle you might be pulling in all kinds of components depending upon what module that you what modules you use and those they might be modules you've never even seen before that you got from somebody else and you don't know all the components that are going on in there that are getting instantiated in there so it would be helpful if you could look at the final the final or, or the initial screen in the layout editor and say oh i called this module and all of these parts are a part of the module and they're all grouped together so i know they all are associated with one another so i better kind of try to keep those grouped with each other and and uh, and keep them close and, and tied together so i think there's a place for skittle to play a role in some of the initial layout but that's really at this point all i can see that that i can do at that you know during that phase of the of the of the design process and are there any interesting or surprising uses of Skittle that you've seen or even uh, interesting uses that you've put it to that you didn't anticipate being able to uh, use it for when you first created it? I really only got it finished uh, in, in September of last year and uh, and I, I announced it on uh, 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 the Python list on Reddit and uh, <laughs> went over like a lead balloon. Uh, so I didn't get a lot of uptake from that. So I don't think that there's many people using it and uh, I've just been kicking the tires on it right now doing, a, doing simple designs with it and trying to uh, fly, flush out any problems that are going on with it. So I don't think it's it's really gotten to the point where where some strange uh, unknown application has been found for it that wasn't kind of anticipated already. Hopefully that'll happen in the future if more people decide to use it. And for anybody who's interested in either working in electrical engineering at a hobby level or somebody who's potentially uh, considering it for a career, what are some of the pieces of advice or uh, recommended reference material that you think that you can point out? Well, there's tons of tutorials, you know, how to make a circuit board. There's tons of YouTube tutorials, how, you know, about the same thing. It also shows you how to assemble these things. The software for laying out or for doing schematics and for doing uh, the circuit boards are, are now um, commonplace, open source and, and free. You can download the KiCad uh, suite of tools, and it's under continuous innovation now with the KiCad team. They're they're improving the schematic editor and the and the PCB layout software, and it does a whole lot more than it than it used to do. And it's probably as good as other software that you you know pay several hundred dollars for. So uh, it's a good place to get started. There are KiCad information groups that you can go to and ask questions and, and get guidance. Uh, I mean, it's it's not like it was when, when I was just starting out where trying to find, you, you'd have to find books on this stuff right now. All you got to do is type in circuit board design and into your browser and you're going, you're on your way. And I found that the, the communities that are, that are um, hosted uh, around this subject area they're pretty friendly you don't get too many crusty old guys like me that'll bite your head off <laughs> are there any other topics or questions that you think we should address before we start to close out the show i think i've talked i think i've talked myself out i i, I think that uh, anything else i say i'm going to just go into the uh, the fields of idiocy if i haven't gotten there already <laughs> but uh yeah I, th I think i've covered skittle if, if you're interested just go to github type in skittle and take a look at it uh i, I got the the website uh there implemented so that it goes through the uh, through some tutorials i'm i'm adding more uh postings there uh, every week to try to just explain what goes on when you when you're trying to use skittle and uh so go and take a look and uh, if you if you use it let me know about it and let me know especially if it causes a problem for you because those are the things i want to fix 
Well, uh, I'll be sure to add all those things into the show notes. And yeah. if there's any uh, preferred uh, contact method that you'd like people to use to reach out to you, I'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well. Okay. Uh, with that, I will move us on into the picks. Okay. For my pick today, I'm going to choose. Uh, I recently got a new backpack because the one that I had had was starting to fall apart. So uh, if you are in the market for a new backpack, the Tectonic backpack from Samsonite is actually pretty nice, uh, well done, solid construction. The laptop compartment is very well padded, which is one of the things that I like to look for in a bag. So all around, I'm pretty happy with it. So uh, if anybody else wants to take a look, I don't think they'll be disappointed. Do you have any picks for us today, Dave? Yeah, I've only got one. Everybody should read Ball Four by Jim Bouton. Uh, it was written back in 1970, and uh, it's just a story about a year that this guy spent playing professional baseball. Uh, it's, but to say that it's a baseball book is kind of like saying that Moby Dick is a book about fishing, but I think uh, <laughs> everybody should read it. All right. Well, I appreciate the recommendation. I'll have to take a look at it. I appreciate you taking the time to share your project with us and uh, tell us more about Skittle and electrical engineering and uh, some of the different pieces that go into uh, that overall process. It's definitely something that I find interesting and uh, I've dabbled in a little bit, but uh, something that I'm sure would be interesting if I had the time to dive into it more. Uh, so again, yeah. thank you for your time. So many interesting things that you that. Both Believe me, I'm 60 years. <laughs> I'm 60 years old. I'm still finding interesting things that that I'd like to dive into, and there's just not enough time in the world to do it. Right. But I really appreciate you having me on the show, and I uh, hope uh, brings out some more people that are interested in Skittle. So I appreciate right. uh, the opportunity to do that. Absolutely happy to have you. Mm-hmm.